Hi everyone, welcome to another Learn, Grow, Invest meeting. So we are, yeah, we're back. So if you notice what's been happening with us, we are kind of trying to break from the last week of every month meetings and we want to actually bring you more content, more, more valuable insight in terms of um, investments. So we're actually trying to ramp up and this this discussion that we're going to have today is just really a, 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 just a little taste of what's to come. We're planning a lot more um, content, a lot more tutorials, you know, as much content as we can bring you as an investment community. That's what we want to do. And so before we kick things off, as usual for us, we're going to open with a brief word of prayer. So let me jump right into that. So Lord, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Lord, that everything that we're about to do and discuss as you know, persons who are interested in, in investments and learning and growing as we become better investors, we pray for your guidance, we pray for your wisdom. Father, we pray that as we seek to become wealthy, that we will not lose the main purpose of why we were created, and that is to give you honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So guys today we have a very very special guest a very dear guest to me uh robert from robert from so many different places but you probably know him mainly from millennial investing or the investors podcast network he's um i'd like to say a good friend of mine and um yeah we're about to have a discussion as a follow-up to our previous discussion in april that was about about a month into the the pandemic. So um, I'm interested to see where he's at in terms of, you know, his his portfolio, what changes he would have made based on our last discussion. He, he, he would have highlighted some key companies that he's watching. So I'm interested to see how those companies are doing. And as usual, if you have questions for him, just post them in the chat. We want you to know, just share this video, share it with your friends, share it with everyone who is interested in investing. And uh, yeah, for everyone who's here, let's welcome Robert. Hey, ah, you're on mute, my friend. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me, guys. Yes, yes. Thanks, Robert, for joining us. So we're just going to jump right into it, right? So in April, we spoke about, we were right about a month in COVID. And, you know, we spoke about a couple of things, but mainly we spoke on, you know, how to, to have a healthy perspective in terms of your portfolio. You spoke a bit about some of the industries, you know, like the cruise lines, and you spoke about some companies. So um, the first question I want to jump into is what, what has really taken place since our conversation in April in terms of your portfolio and your outlook on the stock market? So for me personally, my portfolio has done very well. Uh, I personally joked on Twitter the other day that I've become the best investor that I've ever been in 2020. Uh, that's not necessarily because of my returns, although my returns have probably been some of the best that I've ever had, but mostly because I haven't checked my portfolio really. You know, I've maybe checked it twice since April, since we last mm -hmm. talked. And so the reason for that is because I know I buy good companies that I believe in for the long term. And so I don't need to check on them all the time. And, you know, I'm doing other things. I'm working on building a business and a podcast and a bunch of other different things. So for me, that's really been the biggest key for me. And, and probably the biggest thing that I've learned is just that I'm able to weather the volatility. And I, I do have the risk tolerance to go through what we went through because we did see some stocks fall 40, 50, 60, 70 percent. And yeah. so I think that was a good good test for a lot of people. And for me, I learned that I was able to to weather that storm, take on that risk and continue to hold. So, um, well, I actually share a similar sentiment. So right around maybe August there, I realized that, you know, this, this, this pandemic is really going to be dragging on. So I actually took the approach to kind of step back, you know, watch how things were shaping up the companies that I owned as well. I felt pretty comfortable with them. So I didn't make much changes either. So I, I took profit off one company. Um, and actually, if I held it, it probably would have been worth a lot more now. But I thought it best to at least take something back because 
when when things started to move slowly here and whereas we didn't have a cure but you know we, we, we kept on having new cases i thought it was best to just kind of be a little bit conservative in terms of adding more but i mostly held you know the same portfolio that i would have had before um so in terms of though i know you said you didn't really make a lot of changes but has anything changed for you in terms of your perspective on maybe the companies that you hold? Really, no. You know, I'm a, I'm a bottom-up investor. I really am focused on the companies, and it just so happens that the companies that I like are pretty resistant to what's going on right now anyway. You know, some of my favorites are Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Square. And they're still doing well despite the pandemic, and I expect them to continue to do well into the future. You know, kind of regardless of, of what happens with the pandemic uh, in the short term. And again, I'm investing for five, ten, fifteen years from now, so I'm not really too concerned with what, what's happened since April or, or even what's going to happen over the next year or so. I'm just continuing to buy great companies that I think are at a good value, and continue to hold them for the next five to ten years. Okay. So you're saying that the pandemic has changed nothing about your investment strategy at all? Not at all. <laughs> well, that's 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 an interesting thing to think about. Uh, what what I've done, so it it changed one thing for me in that I started to look at the business model for some companies because I anticipate that you know for some sales may not be the same or you know they may they may have to close some locations based on what's happening. So that's that's what went into my decision not to add more. And I was quite comfortable with some of the allocations that I had, but I, I really, you know, I was, I was one of those persons who started the year thinking that maybe we could be headed for, for a recession. And then when, when the pandemic came, it's like, it was supposed to possibly lead to one, but again, it's been just drawn out. So it's like what should have maybe happened this year, maybe could possibly take care, take take place next year or the year after. So I've been just kind of watching to see what developments, you know, happen. But it's been happening so slowly that I don't know if it makes sense to make any major changes. But that's interesting to me that you're you're not changing anything. That's that's cool. So in terms of the stocks that you're watching, are, are there any that based on, you know, COVID that you're thinking maybe if, if things look a certain way in the next few months, you may take a position in those companies? Not really, because I don't, I don't invest like that. You know, I don't invest saying, okay, we have a, a major event going on right now or a, a macro event that's taking place and I need to invest based on that. I invest in good companies that I believe in for the long term, and I don't think that that's going to be impacted by a short term issue. So right now, I, I do have a small position, it's very small in my portfolio of Southwest, and it's down. But you know, I mean, the hospitality industry, travel industries are getting killed right now. But I'm investing in Southwest for 15 years from now. So you know, what is Southwest going to look at in 2035, not 2021? you know maybe maybe they are going to get hurt in 2021 maybe even 2022 but by 2030 2035 which is what i'm looking at i think i think covid is going to be you know not forgotten but it's going to be long in the rear view mirror and i don't think we're gonna have to worry about it so for me no i'm not looking at companies you know i think there are people that are saying that are buying companies just because they're doing well in, in Corona. And I, I personally think that's a short sighted way to invest. I don't think that, I mean, this is going to be a short term temporary headwind. There's, there's been many issues like this in the past and I don't, I don't personally think that's a great way to invest. Okay. Well, so what I thought, um, so I thought the tech companies would have been a good, I mean, so I believe that you can do, so I'm, I'm definitely, um, I may be about, let's say about 80 to 90% of value investor, but I do take the opportunities to trade where possible. So I, I was looking at, you know, the tech companies. I know Microsoft has done since, since the pandemic, I believe it's, it, it went as low as, I'm trying to remember the numbers. At one point it was about 150, 160. Now it's maybe 216 at the end of today. 
So I, I was looking at the tech companies, the companies that can actually scale and increase their revenues due to the 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 pandemic. So that's what the the short term looked like for me because I wanted to weather the storm for the losses that I may have for some of the companies that I have because there are some companies in my portfolio where um, I'm realizing maybe 20 30 percent losses and you know though that's okay for me if I can get short term you know gains from you know another part of my portfolio I'm definitely going to take advantage of that so I remember you said in the last discussion we had you had maybe about 1% of your portfolio in Zoom. So you've, you've held that you haven't added to that position? No, so, so I just, one thing that I wanna, I wanna drill in on what you said is that you invest in tech companies because you think they're gonna do well in the pandemic or because of COVID. I invest in tech companies too. I'm looking at my portfolio right now. I have positions in Apple, Datadog, MasterCard, Mercado Libre, PayPal, Shopify, Yext, Microsoft, uh, a bunch of other tech companies, the trade desk. So I'm heavily invested in tech, but my thesis isn't because of the pandemic. You said okay. specific. You said specifically that you're investing in these companies because of the pandemic. And you think they'll do well. I'm investing in these companies because I think they're undervalued companies that are going to be great businesses for the next five to ten plus years. Not has okay. nothing to do with the pandemic. So that's that's the shift that that I just wanted to mention there. But uh, in terms of uh, Zoom, yes, I do still have a position. I'm looking at it right now. Uh, it is up 492 nice. percent. Uh, my co my cost basis is 67 dollars, and it looks like Zoom closed today at about 400. So uh, that's the first time I've looked at this position in months. So I honestly wasn't even sure how well it had done. Yeah. But well, so I mean, so this is. This is my thought process, I, and I'm not trying to to convince you or anything, but just for the benefit of those watching. So my my perspective is, if you have the opportunity to, if you know that the environment presents an opportunity for a stock to do well, I believe that it definitely doesn't hurt you to add to that position because you know the environment favors it. It doesn't mean that you're gonna invest only because of the pandemic but if you have a solid company like for example for me i was invested in microsoft because i understand that business very well so i was looking to microsoft to do well anyways the pandemic meant that you know a lot of persons will be using like microsoft teams and so i thought it would just make sense to instead of you know maybe investing in like a manufacturing company or maybe you know, another type of business redirect those funds to Microsoft because it'll tend to do better now. And then maybe when things kind of level off a bit, I can go to add to the other position. So that kind of mindset is what I'm thinking of where if you had a hundred dollars to invest and you'd have spent maybe 10, $10 on 10 companies, maybe you put $50 on one company because of the environment in the short term. And then maybe six months in you you assess or three months in you assess and then you see if you need to split it up otherwise so that's what i mean so that kind of strategy allows a certain flexibility where you you don't just ignore the environment so i'm not saying that you shouldn't invest long term i'm just saying i think maybe an an adaptable approach may suit some investors that's all so it works for a lot of people i mean you're absolutely right that strategy does work for a lot of people I just don't personally do that. That's all. And, and there are, I know there are a lot of a ton of people that do that. You know, when Carnival Cruise Lines went on you know, quote unquote on sale, when they, when they dropped 80%, there's a lot of people that, that barreled into that company and put a lot of money into it. And then, you know, they traded it for over a month, maybe two months and they did well. But for me, I don't personally invest like that. It's just not how I invest. I don't have time to do that. Yeah. I pers I personally don't think that I'm smart enough to guess <laughs> guess where companies are going over the short term uh so so i just i just don't invest like that yeah but it, I know but what it can mean. work it can work for sure i know what you mean because there is that sort of trading does take a certain amount of time commitment that depending on what you do and the things that you're you're responsible for it may not lend itself to having to do that research unless you're going to take somebody else's word for it then they might be wrong and then you're stuck holding a stock that you're not you know comfortable with so yeah i got you um so how is you know the real estate market how how, how is that side of things 
so it's kind of funny. Uh, the real estate market, in, in my opinion, is doing fantastic. It's it's not really what I expected, but it seems very strong. And it, you know what I'm going to say is kind of anecdotal because it's just my experience. You know, I haven't really studied trends too much in terms of other parts of the country, but I haven't heard about a lot of issues other than I mean, commercial real estate is obviously struggling given everything that's going on, but residential, which is where I spend pretty much all of my time investing seems fine. Uh, so I'm currently selling a property of mine and we had it listed for 12 hours for sale and we had 16 showings scheduled. And then by, we put a pause. So we didn't allow any of the showings to actually take place for five days until after we put the house on the market to allow some demand to build up. And then by the time the showings actually started four or five days later, we had 30 showings happen uh, successfully in two days. Uh, before the showings even happened, we received two offers sight unseen on the property, meaning they hadn't even seen the property and they waived all inspections on the property. So they were buying it as is sight unseen. And both pro uh, offers were significantly over asking price. So regardless or, or needless to say, uh, I think the market's very strong, at least where I live. Uh, you know, real estate is hyper local. It's very a local business. So where I live could be strong and across the country and where you are could be, could be a much worse. But for me personally, it, it's very strong right now. Yeah. So it's, it's actually an interesting thing because we're realizing a similar thing here in Jamaica. We're so part of what I was hoping for. So it, it's different when you're a buyer versus a seller. So you're the seller, um, you, for, for it to do well, you want to be able to, you know, maybe get more than what you're asking as a buyer, you're hoping to get it for less. <laughs> than but I, I am buying right now too. I just bought okay. another property. I just bought another property. I sold the, I sold one and I'm buying another one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, my, yeah, we're, we're looking for, for houses here, but we were expecting for it to be different because you know, I do see where, you know, properties that were being used for, for Airbnb, for example, they're not doing as well because of the, the, the pandemic. And I was, you know, hoping to be able to at least get some more attractive deals from a buying perspective because, you know, mortgage rates are more or less the same. The costs for houses are more or less the same. It, it makes it a little challenging because, again, what we, what we spoke about things being slow, what I'm concerned with is if this drags out then you know the prices may not change much and i guess you have to make a decision as a buyer if you're just gonna buy you know because i guess as you said if it's if it's a good value you buy you know because you really can't predict what's what what's gonna happen but it's it's the same thing here so in terms of that strategy though for real estate for you is it that it remains the same based on you know what what you're seeing yeah, I mean, it's it's this kind of the same as how I approach stocks is if, if the numbers make sense, I'm going to buy it. And I don't really pay too, too much attention to the global macro macro trends. And you know what, maybe maybe someday that's going to come back and bite me and maybe I, I'll kick myself and say I should have paid more attention to it. But you know what, I follow Warren Buffett very closely. He's done it for what, 70 years and he's rarely focused on macro trends. And so for me, that's kind of how I'm approaching it. If the, I'm analyzing every deal, if the numbers make sense, I'm going to buy it. And if it doesn't, I'm, I'm not going to. Yeah. So for the benefit of those watching who may not understand what you mean by macro trends. So what, what, what exactly does that mean for you? What, what are the things that you don't focus on? Anything outside of the individual asset that I'm considering. So in the stock market, it's the, the specific company. So say we're looking at Microsoft. If it's not related to Microsoft, I'm not looking at it. You know, so that's things like interest rates, geopolitical climate. So here in the U.S., of course, we just had a major election. Yeah. Uh, coronavirus, things like that. Those are all macro events that are impact that are going to impact these assets, but we don't know how they're going to impact these assets. And in my opinion, there's no way that we could ever know. So for me, we just kind of avoid those and look at what we can know. And so that's by looking at the specific asset that you're looking at. So in the stock market, it's the individual company you're considering buying. In real estate, it's the individual property that you're considering purchasing. So that's that's really where I focus. I focus on the micro, so which is the asset that you're buying, and not so much on the macro, which are the global trends or events that are occurring that we have no control over. 
Okay. So I, I definitely see some benefit in that, I guess, depending on your philosophy in terms of investing, it's definitely a low maintenance approach, just focusing on the asset that you're you're buying because i guess what what that's saying is that you cut down that time to to research and analyze and thinking about the impact of everything that you're that that's happening out there so if, if you're focusing on on macro then you're thinking about how maybe the rise in interest rates have you has as you said is is affecting maybe persons buying power that we, which is affecting maybe how much they'll have to to invest in in the software, in, in this case, Microsoft that we're talking about, you, you're not thinking about that stuff. You're just thinking of things that relate directly to Microsoft. So you're looking at just maybe their reports, any company activity. If it's not labeled Microsoft in the news, you're, you're not watching it. Pretty much. I mean, I do look at trends in the sense of like, you know, are customers moving away from Microsoft products? Are you know, AWS got set up. So who's losing cloud customers to Amazon, you know, things like that, I'll pay attention to, but I'm not paying attention to an election or coronavirus or, you know, all these different things that we have zero control over that are not related to the individual business or asset. Okay. Okay. So I definitely see where, so what I do is not quite, so I, I do think, well, I guess it's that high hybrid approach I would have, as I would have alluded to earlier, because on some level, what I find is that depending on what is happening in in the in, in terms of the, the the macro activities, I may say, well, this period may not. I I may be better off using my cash to do something else, you know, or maybe direct it in a more purposeful way. Maybe I do some things that aren't directed to the stock market, but it's maybe making money in a different way. So so that's how I kind of use it. But I do have uh, any stock that I would buy. I'm not thinking 2035 like you are, but I'm thinking maybe, you know, 2025 or, you know, 2030. And so the companies that I have, um, I'm fairly confident that you know, it's gonna hold real estate. I'm still trying to get used to it. Uh, I think that it's it's one of those things where, so I think there are certain factors that limit how well a, a property can do in, in a certain area. So there's this um, philosophy that we have locally that once you buy real estate, it has nowhere to go but up. I don't necessarily agree, but I'm, I'm fairly inexperienced in that regard. So. What would you, how would you kind of advise somebody to buy real estate as opposed to buying stocks? Because I mean, is it the same thing? Is it different? What, what, what do you say there? Well, at first, I don't think real estate can only go up. I mean, there are markets that I've looked at where prices of houses haven't gone up over 10 years. So uh, th for me, I'm, I'm a really data driven guy. I'm an accountant by trade, finance guy, you know, stock investor. So I go, I approach real estate with a similar approach and I really look at the numbers a lot. And so for me, it's kind of funny. I don't look at macro trends in the stock market and I don't really, when I'm looking at properties, but I do look at demographic trends. So are people moving into the area? Are people moving out of the area? Are jobs, is there more jobs? Is there job growth happening? Uh, are income levels rising historically over the last 10 years have property values been increasing and then lastly how is crime been trending if crime is trending up i don't tend to like to invest there if crime is trending down then i would consider investing there but the biggest thing for me is population if people are leaving the area price values are going to follow that price values are going to go down because it's a supply and demand issue and if there's no no if there's supply the supply is probably not going to change significantly down which is the only way that the prices could go up with people leaving and so since that's not going to happen the supply is going to remain pretty steady and you're going to see the demand decrease with people moving out of the area and that's going to cause prices to decline so for me population is probably one of the biggest things i want to see a growing population into where i'm investing okay so so does that mean for example if you own a property and crime starts to go up, are you looking to sell or are you maybe trying right out of that storm? It depends. I mean, it, crime is one of those things, it takes time. So it you, you probably wouldn't notice until it got to a point. I mean, 
it just takes a while. I don't feel like crime is not going to change. I don't think in general crime is going to change enough in a year or two years that you're going to be like, okay, now I need to sell this property. I use it more from the perspective of what markets I'm trying to consider to get into. So when I'm looking, I invest long distance, so I don't invest locally where I live. And so I use this data to try and determine where I'm going to invest. And so if crime has been trending up, then I'm not necessarily going to consider that market, not necessarily so much as a sell signal, but more as a buy signal as to where I should or should not consider investing. Okay. So, so where would one, so let's say for example, that, so, since you're buying out of state, uh, I imagine that there may be some requirements different for someone who's trying to purchase internationally, but what, where can one find that data in terms of the, the real estate market? So if, if, if I wanted to look up properties in, in, in a certain state, where can I get that information? Where can I go to get information on, on properties that I'd want to buy? So outside of the U.S., I, I honestly don't know, uh, but within the U.S., uh, there's uh, census data from the U.S. government. So they do uh, surveys every year or every couple of years to get census data. And that census data is where you get, get the data that you need. They publish it publicly on the Internet, and there's websites that you can use to look up this data. And one of the ones that I use is called city-data.org. Okay. And that's that's probably my go-to. Okay, I'll ask the one of the moderators to type that in. Everyone to see. Okay, so um, in terms of that kind of process, so buying buying a a, a new property. Um, you mentioned you know looking at the demographic data. You mentioned that resource that you just shared about getting you know information on the property. How how is it that you determine a fair price for that property? So if it's a four unit or less, a property is valued based on comps, which means it's based on uh, properties that have sold that are similar to that in the area within the last usually one to six months. So if you're buying or selling a two bedroom house with one bathroom, they're gonna look at all the two bedrooms, one bathroom houses in the area that have sold in the last few months and okay. then they're gonna they're gonna value your house based on that uh, if you're looking at more than four units so if you're looking at five units or up it's based on a cap rate and on your net operating income so these are com considered commercial properties in the United States and they are based on a multiple of the net operating income that they produce okay 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 so what would be so so let's say that someone and, and i would have asked you this question before and uh, because i think it's it, it's a relevant one meaning in, a, in our last meeting how does one get to the point where they are able to acquire their first property i still think that the best way to acquire your first property is to house hack i think that's the best way and, and i don't know if that's possible across the globe i would assume that it is but i don't know that for sure but at least here in the u.s uh, the best way is the house hack. And for those who don't know, basically all what house hacking is uh, at its simplest form means buying a property that has more space than you need and renting out all the additional space. So you could buy a single family house that has five bedrooms. Say you only need one or two of the bedrooms for yourself. You rent out the other three or four bedrooms. That would be considered a house hack. You could buy a two unit. You could buy a three unit. You could even buy a four unit. You live in one of the units. You could rent out all the additional units. And that would also be considered a house hack. But basically, at its simplest form, a house hack just means you buy a property that's bigger than you need, has more space than you need, and you rent out all the additional space to make sure that your mortgage is as cheap as possible for you and allows you to live for free or as close to free as possible. Okay. And at what point do you try for another property? Really, once you have the money again, I mean, it's really up to you, right? I mean, it depends if you're comfortable with, if you like it, you know, they call it like a test run of, of being a landlord because you get to, to be a landlord or so I've heard some people call it landlord light, uh, meaning, you know, it's the light version of, of being a landlord. And so, I mean, it really depends on, on the person. So you could house hack and realize you hate being a landlord and you don't like owning real estate. You'd rather just stick in the stock market. In that case, you don't buy another property ever. Or, or at least not for a long time, or you just let somebody else do it and you give your money to a fund and, or invest in a syndication or something like that. 
Yeah. If you house hack and you like it, then you buy your next property as soon as you can. You know, you have to live in the property for a year here in the US before you can move out. So you probably have to do it after at least a year. But basically, as soon as you're comfortable with the whole process and as soon as you have enough money to do so, you can go ahead and buy your next property. Okay. Okay. Well, definitely being a, land, a landlord is different. <laughs> you, you really have to see. I guess just like with investing, you have to see whether or not you have the temperament for it, or what type of risk or situations you like to deal with. And I know that some in some cases, you know, living with your, your tenant may present, you know, a certain dynamic that maybe you're not comfortable with. So that trial run is definitely worth it, I think. Uh, so in terms of, um, well, uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you as well. So in terms of just since since our last meeting, what's what's the most interesting thing maybe about the market that you've seen, whether real estate or stock that you know you wanted to to comment on? What's the most interesting thing for you? The most interesting thing has just been how resilient the stock market has been. I mean, we saw it decline rapidly in March and yeah. it's back to where it was and, and significantly surpassed that, you know, other than that, I really, again, I just really haven't followed the markets that closely. Not, not that I still study them, but I just haven't followed the news that much. You know, I'm, I'm more reading the books and things like that about strategy than I am focusing on where the stock market is going day over day. Uh, I think it's super interesting what's happening in the commercial real estate space. Um, I think that that's not really that interesting because I mean, it's kind of a given we could kind of expect that was going to happen. Uh, so I, I think really just the surprising thing is how some companies are faring during this and how they've bounced back so much. I just, like I said, I own a position in Southwest. I bought it towards the bottom of, of the crash. And I did that because I, not because I wanted to short term trade it, but I've been wanting to buy Southwest. I couldn't, I didn't think there was a good value for a while. And then with the decline, I thought there was. And so I, I entered a position and I've been negative ever since on that one position. It's the only negative position in my portfolio, but I just looked and it's only down 1%. And if you told, if you told me in March yeah. that an airline company was only going to be down 1% from where it was at March, which was most likely, and don't quote me on this, but probably an all time high or pretty close to it. And it's only down 1%. That's incredible. Yeah. And so to me, that's been the most interesting part of this whole situation. I, I found that equally interesting as well, because I wonder, so before COVID stocks just seemingly have been going to all time highs. And so that's why most persons were kind of waiting to see, you know, how the market would have responded in 2020 you know, COVID comes now, there are some companies that seem to not be able to do as well. But for the most part, people seem as as optimistic as ever based on how they're buying, which is I'm I'm absolutely curious as to see how this will turn out as well, because I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> I don't Nobody know. What's does. Gonna, Nobody does, good. and that's yeah. that's the best part about investing. Yeah, yeah. Because it it you know, we, we saw we see this thing where, you know, at a catalyst would happen maybe there's a sell down for a day or two maybe a week at most and then it's like nothing happened so those persons who are trading for example if you're if you're a good trader you're probably you know benefiting or riding that wave if you're a long-term investor you're still really not doing that bad depending on how your portfolio was set up if you are if if you are appropriately diversified you would have had maybe you know, 10 to 20% in some cases, as you said, you know, um, less. So it, it's really very interesting that the market is, you know, pretty much holding up, I would, I would say, because it's, it's that based on, if you take away COVID, the market position in general, you probably would never, would never know that there's a pandemic. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting that that's happening, which, I wonder if persons are smart up, so they're not as reactive, or persons are not <laughs> are not taking the right caution. Like I really don't know which it is, you know, because persons are either being really smart or they're not being smart. I don't know which, um, you know. And I say that because at, it, it's it's interesting for me to see, 
even where and i know we didn't plan to speak about this one but to see where 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 the crypto markets are at you know um bitcoin is pretty much back to where it was in in 2017 and i've that's just interesting to me that it's it, it's almost like the only thing that's that's behaving as you would expect is bitcoin and everything else is happening the way that you don't expect but we're, we're, we're not gonna go there because i don't think you you know I, I i don't remember what you had mentioned about about cryptocurrency i know preston is is talking about it weekly um but i don't know where where you are in terms of you know cryptocurrencies what's what, what's your take on that my opinion on cryptocurrencies is that i don't really have one <laughs> uh i mean i i obviously know preston well and i chat yeah. frequently and and I, i'm you know lucky enough through the podcast to speak to some of the greatest minds in crypto and so uh, i've been able to have some really great conversations about it i i i understand the financial and monetary fiscal economic impacts of what bitcoin can provide and what it's looking to solve i get that i don't understand the technology behind it i don't think i'm ever going to i'm not that's not how my brain works and that's without my circle of com without my circle of competence so uh, i don't think i'm going to try and ever understand it from that perspective but kind of how i'm approaching it is there's a lot of really smart people that i respect that believe in it uh, there are some smart people that i respect that don't believe in it and so yeah. for me so for me, how I think about it is, I think to myself, I take some time and I, I really do some self-reflection and I say, okay, if Bitcoin goes up and I don't own a position, am I going to be more mad that I missed out on the train? Or would I be more mad if I did buy some and I lost the money? Which would make me more, which would make me more mad? And, or which would bother me more? And for me, I'd rather, I'd rather lose a little bit of money than miss out on the upside. So if what I did is I allocated 1% of my portfolio. I said, if this goes up as much as these guys think it's going to, all I need is 1% and I'll do very well. If it goes to zero, I mean, that will suck, but it's only 1% of my portfolio and it is what it is. So for me, I don't really track it that much. I don't really study it that much. I don't, I'm not really super concerned with it. I just put a small portion of my portfolio. So I have a little bit of allocation to it a little bit of skin of the game and just kind of let it ride and see what happens yeah so so again that concept of just um diversification it's there if it does it's so there's no one stuck in your portfolio that will will break you pretty much is what you're saying uh stock wise there is uh cryptocurrency wise there's not i'm not i'm not a very diversified investor at all i, I run a very concentrated portfolio yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say that Bitcoin was even a diversification play. It was just a, it was more of a play. Like I want to have some skin in the game because I want to be able to take advantage of some upside if there is any, but I don't want to have so much skin in the game that if it goes to zero, then I lose so much that it hurts. So I just wanted to be at least a little bit involved. Uh, now when my stock portfolio, uh, it's very different. I do, I do not diversify very much. Uh, I do have, uh, a decent number of picks but when you look at the amount of my portfolio i have like 85 to 90 percent of my portfolio in five companies yeah. so I, I wouldn't really say that's very diversified yeah i i understand what you mean because 50 percent of my portfolio is in one stock <laughs> and yeah i then, think my most is 30. yeah and then i have you know, a couple of stocks that are like you know, 10%, no, like 5%. I have like five stocks at 5%. So that's about 75%. And then I have about five or six more. No, it's, it's, it's worse than that. I have, it's, it's, there's one stock that's 50 and then the rest are kind of, you know, negligible. Um, so really I've waited whether or not, um, I should actually shift that but I really stick to what I know. So the one stock that I'm holding that much in, I know it well. Uh, if, if there's anything that should happen, I'll, I'll get a pretty good idea before it would get to the public. So I'll know, you know whether or not I need to adjust my position early. And it, it pays me healthy you know, dividends where you know, I'm comfortable with what's there. It's just that it's, it sometimes makes me wonder whether or not that's the best strategy. But I mean, since, yeah, so far so good, I guess. Um, I did have, 
a few years back i was more active in 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 cryptocurrencies but um internationally it's not the same as it is in the us it was it was very hard for us here in in jamaica to get access to our to our funds if we were to sell there was a big thing about it back when i first started so that made me shy away from you know actively trading even though i understood the market well enough i, I saw it as a trading play more than an investment play meaning for long term because the markets are so volatile where it, it was excellent for trading but you know it's a, they're they're kind of changing their tune to it now so we've heard you know the the stock exchange mentioned that they're gonna you know be be facilitating cryptocurrency well they said that two years ago we're we're still waiting for it here but you know it's 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 just really hard because of the fees the fees make it really cumbersome to to acquire and to actively trade so i thought it best to just hold a portfolio you know i'm thinking again you know five to ten years and then i'll see where it's at but it's an amount where it's probably it's about one percent no 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 yeah one percent no maybe four percent of my my overall portfolio so again that's still not that much where if it should go down to zero i'm okay but if it goes up i'm still down actually from <laughs> from from 2017 um and that, that's an interesting story that we'll probably share offline i'll tell you about that but um we did have some questions from our 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 community so um, i'm gonna start with the with the real estate market because i think most of our 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 community will want to hear about the stock market so we'll close with that one but um first question for you from our community was what what states are currently the most favorable in terms of the real estate market it depends what you mean by favorable some people invest depending on your cash flow meaning how much profit each month the properties will make uh some mark some people will invest mostly for appreciation and generally you don't find markets that have a lot of appreciation and a lot of cash flow so generally you want to look for cash flow uh, states in the middle of the us and that's the midwest generally uh, if you're looking for appreciation then you technically or generally want to be on the coast east or west coast generally okay well i guess um in terms of favorable it's probably um from the mindset of i guess profit because favorable yeah you're, you're right it, it would be depending on where the person was asking the question from the base okay all right so um in terms of property type so state was one thing but in terms of property type what would be um i guess same phrasing favorable what what type of property um answer it from two perspectives let's say favorably in terms of a first unit and i know you touched a little bit on that but favorable let's say that um i'm looking to have maybe multiple transactions over maybe a one-year period which type of property would suit that that sort of active buying and selling i would look for residential properties that are less than four units i i mean you could go more than that as well but i wouldn't be touching anything in the commercial real estate space right now and so pretty much anything that's not in commercial real estate or airbnb so these short-term rentals uh, i wouldn't touch right now but residential like houses or even small apartment buildings i think those are going to do very well because people need places to live and especially if you're in a suburb or an uh, non-urban market so you know, you're, you're, a lot of people are fleeing the cities now to go to, to areas that are less dense, where there's less people. And I think you're going to see a lot of properties, small residential properties in those areas do really well. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so the next question was about REITs. So before you respond, I'll ask you what, what is a REIT first thing for those who, who don't know? And are they a favorable option in the US market? Yeah, they can be, they can be. I don't personally invest in REITs, uh, not because I don't like REITs. I do like REITs a lot, actually. Uh, the reason I don't invest in them is because I have enough exposure to real estate through my own personal real estate holdings. So through my own rental properties, I own enough real estate to satisfy my allocation. 
if I chose to invest in REITs as well in the stock market, then when you look at my portfolio as a whole, I would be overweighted towards real estate. So I tend not to, to invest in REITs. Uh, what I would caution people to consider if they are considering REITs is to see what the REITs exposure is to commercial real estate. So uh, mall space and office buildings and things like that, you're gonna, I think you're gonna be struggling. I think a lot of REITs are gonna be in trouble because of that. If you find some REITs that might be in the healthcare space that have invest in hospitals or um, elderly homes, things like that, those might be doing very well right now. Again, I don't, I don't invest like that, so I don't know for sure. Uh, but if I was looking at a REIT, I would look at uh, REITs with apartment buildings, uh, residential real estate, or or specialty real estate that's not commercial, not related to schools. Uh, you know, there's some REITs that are related to student housing. I would avoid anything that's related or being impacted negatively by the coronavirus and focus on things that are uh, long-term going to do well, like residential real estate. Okay. So pretty much you're saying, look at, look, look at the underlying REIT, see how it is made up and then make that determination from there as to whether or not you're going to be investing in it. Yes. Yep. Okay. It's interesting that you said it that way, because on one hand you're saying, you're not looking at the macro, but then you just say, pay attention to those that may be impacted by COVID. Or is that just, you know, best practice for those who may be new to, to the game? Uh, new to the game, but I also think that when you're investing, when you're investing in a REIT, you're putting your money into a fund and you're expecting somebody else to manage it with mm -hmm. an asset that's struggling. If you're investing yourself and you're making your own investment decisions, that's different than than giving it to somebody else to invest because you're making your own decisions and you can avoid certain things and you have no control over what they're buying. And so for me, again, I'm not looking at trends. I, I, I thought commercial real estate was going to be in trouble anyway because of coronavirus, before coronavirus, because of, of people working from home, things of that nature. You know, technology is making it easier than ever for people to work from home. And this is all pre-COVID. You know, I don't think commercial real estate was as dire as it is today, but I still, I wasn't a big fan of commercial real estate. And I certainly wasn't a fan of malls, uh, shop, you know, physical retail. So those are the types of things that I was avoiding anyway because of before COVID. So it, it kind of just not really a trend follow, but it, it kind of just fits in there. Yeah, interestingly enough, um, on that point, what I noticed is that the things that you are expecting, so so when, when they would speak about technology and working from home, in my mind, pre-COVID, I was thinking, okay, five years, 10 years, that has been sped up to now. And, you know, that that sort of breakdown in the market that we're expecting that collapse, that slowed down. So one thing sped up, you know, five, 10 years and another kind of is still taking forever. <laughs> so that's, that's quite interesting because I do think, so we have this kind of strategy that I noticed in, in Jamaica where some companies have not fully embraced working from home. So they have employees coming in and then if there is a case, if, if there is a COVID case, then everybody has to be sent home which to me doesn't make sense. That's not sustainable, a sustainable model because they're ignoring putting in the infrastructure that they will need to manage their business. No, when they have to send home everybody, that business suffers because now your processes aren't really you know, making sense or it's not conducive to persons working from home. So, and I still see some real estate properties being put up, um, some commercial spaces where the rates are still the same and i wonder if these persons understand that they're not going to be able to pay rent or, or pay their mortgage very soon and i thought you know as you said those rates were pretty much too just too much so before covid i thought running a business from home makes sense i thought you know having a model that can scale easily without having a property makes sense because you know a few years back i used to rent commercial property for a company that I owned. And that was maybe that expense next to salaries were, you know, very close in terms of the, the highest amount of expense I had as a business. And it, it choked us out in terms of profit. So we weren't able to make any money because of the rent we were paying and the amount of staff that we had being able to pay salaries, being able to pay overheads was just too much. And I've always thought that properties were renting for way more than they should have 
you know, especially for small businesses. So, yeah, and I, I say all of that to say that I agree with you in terms of that that perspective in terms of commercial real estate, definitely. All right, so we have just a few more questions. Uh, so recently for us, so typically if a person wanted to buy stocks on the US market from Jamaica, for example, we would use an app called eToro. I found out that was recently blocked for us. I don't know if that has changed because again, my portfolio has pretty much been the same but you know someone wanted to know you know what are their options for purchasing maybe out of out of the us into the us or maybe you know what how can a person trade internationally i'm not sure if you can speak speak on that i can't speak uh, to it a lot i could give a little bit of context um, i can't speak to investing outside the us into the us i live here in the us so I don't have experience doing that, of course. I have invested outside of the US through my brokerage account, through Fidelity. They're one of the largest stock uh, brokerage houses in the US, so I just use them. They allow me to trade on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and other exchanges as well, and that's how I've done it in the past. I don't know if there's anything like that any brokerages in Jamaica that would allow you to invest in the US or other countries. But here in the US, uh, you just apply for that through your brokerage and they allow you to do it. Okay, we do have some here, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's, there, it's, it's, it's not a large amount of them, meaning the ones that I know of, I think, you know, in general, it's probably more in terms of fees, a little bit more flexible to have, would have purchased through an app like eToro. But I do know that some more and more brokerage firms are offering the service. So I'm probably not as updated as I should be on it. But um, I do know that there there are a few that, that offer it. And yeah, I think most persons just kind of prefer to be able to have their own flexibility, put some funds on a credit card, purchase, um, I did hear about a company called Interactive Brokers. I took the process to get set up on the app, but there was one thing that I needed to do. So it was, it allowed me to set up my account through the app, but I needed to authenticate. There was something that it needed to do. Um, I'll try and post it in the chat after this video is done, but um, there's one step that I needed to do, but I was able to set up the account. It's called Interactive Brokers, that's, that's the name of it. It does have an app that you can download, go through the process. You will need to share ID, you know, proof of address, standard stuff, and you'll need to have an account though that they can, you know, kind of debit to confirm that you, you are who you say you are, and then, yeah, so interactive brokers is how I would answer that question for that person who asked. So, yeah, um, I do have a Fidelity account, but because I don't have a social security number, I can't trade with what's in my account. So I have some stock there, but it's, it's through a source that I didn't control. So it's there so I can sell, but I can't buy, which makes no sense to me because I have the account with you. I should be able to sell that and then just manage the account, but they have this policy when I call their support that I can't trade because I don't have a social security number. That was one of those things that I was hoping that would change with COVID because you know people sometimes have to go through means that are more costly to do the same thing if a company would just allow you to trade the stock. You know what I mean? Like it it, it doesn't make sense to me for 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 agencies to do that. The truth is, my I know for tax purposes because I know there is, um, well, I don't remember the term right now, but I know there's a um, a tax that you pay when you sell your 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 stocks, right? Yeah, capital gains tax. Yes, cap that's 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 the word I'm looking for. So I mean, apart from that tax, that tax can be collected whether or not I have a social security number or not, you know, I'm not sure why that would be there. Uh, the next question that's there for you, Robert, is um, this concept of shorting a stock. You know, um, what is it? How would you successfully do it? And do you think it's a good idea to short a stock? 
That is a very big question, and we could talk about that for an hour in and of itself. Uh, I'll try to give a brief overview of what shorting is, uh, and I'll kind of give my thoughts on shorting. Uh, so what shorting is, is basically you're betting against the stock is basically in its simplest form. That's what it is, is you're, you basically, when you go long a stock, you're betting that the stock is going to go up in value and you'll make money if it appreciates in value. Uh, when you're shorting a stock, that means you're betting that the stock is going to go down and you're going to make money that way. Uh, that's the simple way. That's the theoretical way of how it works. Uh, technically, what happens is you short a stock and your brokerage will go and take that stock from somebody else. They'll borrow it from somebody else and they'll sell it on the market. And then you'll get those proceeds. And then at a later date, what you have to do is you have to buy that stock back at the market price and then instantly sell it and give those shares back to the person that you borrowed it from. And so that can get a little bit confusing but that's how it works that's how the broker does it they do that all behind the scenes for you you just say you're going to short it on your computer screen and they'll take care of all that for you uh, but that's the process that's how it works theoretically that's what's going on uh, now my opinion on it uh, theoretically i love shorting i've never actually done it though so in theory i love it uh in theory i love it in practice i'm scared of it and the reason of that is because with shorting there's unlimited risk and capped potential with going long it's unlimited potential with capped risk so with okay. shorting with shorting the most that you could ever make with a short no matter what is 100% so if you bought a, a company and you shorted it and it went to zero it went bankrupt the most money that you could ever make is 100% However, if you short a company and the stock goes against you, meaning the value of the price of the stock goes up, you have unlimited risk because that stock technically could go to infinity. So while you can only make 100% on the downside, uh, we've seen Zoom go up, like I just said, 500%. If that stock went up 500%, you could be down 500%, which what that means is you're down five times what you put into that money. So you're... Wow. Instead of being up five times, think about what that does on the downside. You're down five times. So if you put in $100, you would be down $500. So you can lose more than you put in. And so it's very risky uh, from that perspective. So that's what it means is there's capped, capped potential, meaning the most you can make is 100%. Uh, there's unlimited risk, meaning you could lose way more than you put into the position. Uh, on the long side, it's the exact opposite. If you invest in a company, the most you could ever lose is what you put into the company. You can never lose more than 100%. That's the most you could ever lose. But on the upside, you could technically earn thousands of percent, right? Zoom is up 500%. People that bought Amazon are up 20,000%. So the, the potential that you could earn is unlimited on the upside, but very capped on the downside. So uh, shorting can be very, very, very risky. It can be good for the short term, uh, but it's a very risky strategy. And so for that reason, I tend to stay away from it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I've, I've seen a few persons locally ask for, you know, the local stock exchange to start shorting stocks. And I think that's because they feel like they can take advantage of the emotion of the market. You know, if something doesn't do favorable or if somebody you know, in a certain position starts to speak a certain way about the stock, then they see an opportunity to short it because they may be able to predict that is it's going to trend down for a little bit and then they'd sell it and, you know, recover or, or make profit in that way. We, we always, well, not we always, but there are times when persons focus a lot on the upside and not on the downside. So that's definitely an interesting take on shorting. I've never heard it explained that way. It's actually quite an interesting take on it, as as GK is saying in the chat. And so, just two more questions for you. In terms of, um, you know, there was there was news about uh, a vaccine the other day. There's actually multiple, but there was one specifically that came out, I think, last week. Um, you know, about uh, so. So the question is phrased, do you think that the, the downward trend that was that's happening to some of the tech stocks based on the vaccine news, do you think that's just kind of short term? Um, you know, what do you, I know I know you're not 
you know, used to thinking in, you know, one to three month block, but what do you think? You know what I'm going to say, Jermaine, you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't invest like that. I, I honestly, I don't, I don't have a good answer for you because I don't invest like that. Um, you know, some of the companies that are, are being hit the last couple of weeks are down a couple, you know, 20%, but I'm up 500%. So 20% is not a big deal to me. Uh, I'm investing for the next 10 years. I'm, I'm not worried about uh, what's happening with the vaccine over the next six months. Well, so, so let me, let me phrase it this way then. Do you think it's a good time to enter a position in a in a tech company you know as you said it's up 500 percent this year alone should should you buy a, a tech stock right now depends on the company okay depends on the valuation depends on the company depends on your prospects for the company it depends how you feel about the company i mean there's there's is it a good time to buy zoom probably not that's my opinion i could be wrong it could go up 500 percent from here maybe it's a great time. I don't know. Uh, is it a good time to buy a different company? Maybe again, I don't know. Uh, it, it's depends on the valuation. It depends on, on the prospects of the company and you just have to do your analysis on every single company. <laughs> yes. Yes. GK. Um, GK is saying that you're, you're investing the, the, the Buffett way. Very know? much so. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's 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 interesting. I I, I do agree to some extent. Um, I do think that. So one, I do think that the, the market is made very interesting with with the dynamic that it presents, right? So for me, it's like a a sort of this this movie I'm watching to see how persons react to news, and then you know this one is up this week, it's down next week. I think it's all. You know, very interesting to see just the, the the emotion and such sort of um how do you say it? It's 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 I like how the markets can sometimes be predictable but so unpredictable. So that's all fun for me. So I I, I find it very interesting when persons make certain decisions in the short term, not thinking about the long term, and I think sometimes persons are focused too long term and not see the opportunities to make money in the short term because ultimately to me you're you're investing to make money so you put yourself in the best position to make money because on the one hand if you're thinking long term which is great as, as i do as well i don't know if i'm going to be able to make the same money three years from now that i'm making now so i try to make the best decision best decision for now and you know, hopefully it remains the same three years from now, but I don't know. So I, I invest from the perspective that if I don't if if my income is half, you know, next year what it was this year, what would I buy? You know, how would I use the money that I have now? And so I try to have a balance of both short term and long term at the same time because you know, and, and, and that's probably because of my age, Roberta, we speak about this all the time. You're you're looking at it from a different perspective. You're 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 a little bit younger than I am. <laughs> and so you're you're thinking, you know, 20, 30 years from now, but I'm thinking 15 years from now, 10 to 15, really. So I, I think that's why it's maybe a little bit different for me. You know, I'm thinking about you know, investing in a way that I don't have to. Well, I think we shared that part where we're we're investing not to kind of monitor it a lot, but to make smart decisions. But I really do believe in in maximizing short term gain as well if you can. So I'm I'm not going to. I always you know think that if for some reason the market can function for a week or for two weeks, we don't know. You know, it's it the more we become digital, I think there's a sort of risk that's presented that maybe we're not foreseeing right now. So there's even some reason we can't access the market for a week. That's a very interesting situation. So I, I, I have to think short term in the sense that, you know, let me see how much I can take off the table now while I can, but then I definitely see value in focusing long term as well. So um yeah it's really for for the investor to choose if you're watching this you know make the best decision based on the information that you have but be sure to get a certain amount of information where you can make 
you know, practical decision. And that's, you know, everything that Robert has really alluded to. You know, it, it, it may sound weird for some persons to, to hear Robert say it depends for <laughs> almost every question that we've covered so far. And it really does depend because you can't say one response to, to every question because it may be different based on your unique situation. So I definitely agree with, with Robert for all his, all his responses, though my, my priorities and decisions may be different. Um, oh, I think I actually missed a question. So um, final question for you, Robert, because I'm not seeing any in the chat. So this is a final question. Um, well, two, two questions, actually. So the first one is outside of the tech and pharmaceutical industry, which areas do you think are good areas to invest in? I'm not going to say the time period because you're not going to focus short term. So, yeah, which <clears throat> area should persons be looking at? So you would have mentioned MasterCard before, and, and I imagine that you're still bullish on them. But where else would you be looking at right now? FinTech is my favorite. Oh. FinTech is where I'm, I'm focusing. This is not investing advice. I don't, I, you know, everybody do your own due diligence. But for me personally, 80% uh, of my portfolio is in FinTech. Okay. Okay. So what are what are some of the fintech companies? If persons aren't, we, we always assume that somebody watching may not know anything that we're talking about. So what's 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 fintech? How would you categorize a fintech company? Square, PayPal, Visa, Mastercard, Green Dot. Okay. Okay. Those companies. So it's All the right. intersection. It's the intersection of financial finance and technology. The so companies that are doing things like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that's an interesting space to watch because I see where we're definitely going to be taking more transactions digitally. And so there, there's definitely um, more room to grow for those spaces. I wish we had the same access that that um, you have in the States to some of those companies because in, in terms of investing overall, there's a lot more that you have access to in the US than, than we do from, from this side. And a lot of persons just aren't experienced or maybe, again, maybe because of the fees, it, it's maybe not as as conducive to. So there is there's a currency. So the US dollar is um, 150 to one in terms of exchange rate for us. So if I wanted to buy, so one Amazon stock is probably what some persons make in a few months <laughs> so you know if somebody wanted to own one amazon stock it's not as easy to to purchase and so that that challenge kind of presents a unique situation for us um so we have to i guess work with mostly local companies until we get to a certain point so for example with microsoft stock i had to buy you know single digit units at a time until i was able to build up you know, over a few years. So that's, you know, presents an, an, you know, an interesting thing for us here. So in terms of final thoughts, you know, Robert, on, on the market, on investing, you know, best best practices, is there anything that, that you recommend as, as a new investor? So let's say that somebody's brand new to, to investing, you know, where would you have them focus or what would your your advice be going into the end of the year and into to 2021? Uh, in the stock market, invest long term. Don't day trade, don't short term trade. And in real estate, try and house hack as soon as you can. Those would be <laughs> my two biggest pieces of advice. Yeah. Yeah. OK. OK. Well, definitely we're going to, um, I'll, as, as best as our schedule might allow, I think it works so that way maybe speak, you know, every four to six months. Um, Cause I'm, I'm very interested to see that, that strategy of not looking at the macro trends, how that will work out for you, you know, in the long term. Um, as the Chike is asking about um, if you're, if you're ignoring the noise around the medical companies and strictly focusing on, on FinTech. Yes, I would personally never invest in a company based on any sort of uh, speculation of a, a, a vaccine or anything like that. I, I would personally never invest like that. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Um, people make money. People make money like that. It's just not how I invest. Yeah, yeah. I got you. I got you. So I would, um, you know, to answer that question from my side, and it depends. So I actually I look at the price. Um, I look at potential for profit. So if a company is, if if its fair value is determined to be two hundred dollars and it's now you know a hundred, I'll buy that. You know, if it's eighty dollars, I'll buy that. Um, especially if now you add the environment and the and the macro conditions to make it sort of like a perfect cocktail for it to grow. It's not guaranteed. Nothing is in gar is guaranteed in terms of investing. I want to leave that with you definitely. Don't think that it's going to be you have to because as much as you may have news that favor the stock going up, there may be news that you're not aware of tomorrow that could change that same stock that you just bought, the, the outlook for it. So um, we would just want to leave that with you. Robert, thank you so much. I really do appreciate the, the time. Um, I was hoping that we'd get some um, some questions from from the from the group. I wanted to do a shout out to those guys. It's been a while since I've been active there. But if you're if you're unfamiliar, can you just say say Robert how persons can contact you? Tell us a little bit about the Facebook group that you have. That it's a pretty great group to be a part of if you are if you are not a member. Well, I appreciate that. So we have a couple different things. I have two podcasts. One is called Millennial Investing. Uh, one is called Real Estate Investing. Those are probably the best places to find me. Um, on social media, Instagram, Twitter is where I'm most active. And then we also have a Facebook group uh, that has uh, 1,500 or so people in it. Uh, lots of great lots of, lots of great conversations happening with people and uh, happy to, to connect with anybody that would like to, to chat. Yeah, I, I, I can attest to that, Robert. It's very easy to to engage. You'll always respond. Um, as as very shocked, Robert, when, when we first met, how, how quick you were to respond to, to to me reaching out. I'm glad that we're able to, to connect. And yeah, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from just following you on social media. So um, Robert is on IG, Twitter, Facebook. Um, definitely follow him if you haven't done so. His links are in the description directly below this video. So, yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, I'll see you in a few months, right? Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. All right, guys. So thank you so much for joining us for this discussion with Robert. We do have two days from now a session with the 876 Invest Group that we're going to be looking at investment strategies for you know investor in general so what what are some of the things that you can focus on to make better decisions in terms of investment you know just some of the the, the um nuances just to figure out that some persons have a hard time knowing where to focus what to focus on so those are some of the things that we'll have you know justin and david from the 876 group to speak about as i said before we're going to be focusing on a lot more content for you so you know, we're asking you to share this video, to subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. We want to grow this community. It's a free community. All, all the content that we are putting out is at no cost to you. All you have to, the, the only payment is to subscribe. That, that helps us to reach more persons. So, you know, definitely appreciate you watching and I'll see you in a couple of days.